I introduce the uh, discussion of the Shalosh Shavuos, the very famous passage in Maseches Ksuvos, uh, Kuf Yud Aleph, about the three oaths. And I, wa I want to revisit it a little bit. Uh, the Gemara in Ksuvos, Daf Kuf Yud Aleph, is talking about the great spiritual merit of living in Eretz Yisrael. Some very, very beautiful passages about how when the rabbis would come to Eretz Yisrael from Bavel or whatever, they would literally uh, bow down, they would get on the dirt, and they would kiss the stones. Some people to this very day actually have such a minag, putting aside the issue of bowing down on stone, uh, they, you know, they come, bow down, they uh, kiss the ground as they land. Uh, today it's a little different, but in the olden days when the airplanes would uh, land and you'd have to walk or take a bus to the terminal, so you were on the tarmac, and people on the tarmac would sometimes kiss. Today, you know, you're in the terminal, terminal right away, so you don't have, most people are not going to kiss the terminal of Ben-Gurion, uh, etc. So the Gemara goes through the idea that uh, Eretz Israel is a beautiful place, a, a spiritual place, a holy place. You're close to Hashem. And again, let me remind you that the Rambam brings all of those passages, even though he paskins that living in the land of Israel is not a mandatory mitzvah, he still brings all of those beautiful passages. But in the middle of that, in the middle of that discussion, let me just be sure this is on one second. Yeah. In the middle of that discussion, the Gemara seems to take a left turn by bringing a statement of an Amora that God made the Jewish people take three oaths when the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed. And the three oaths are based on a Pasuk in Shir Hashirim that is repeated three times. I will actually go over the exact language of the Pasuk right now, but just to enumerate the oaths, uh, the, the Pasuk begins, Hishpati etchem benot Yerushalayim, I make you swear, daughters of Jerusalem. And the three oaths are, lo yalu bachoma, Literally, do not ascend over the wall. Bit of an enigmatic expression. The second is, lo yimredu ba'umos. Do not rebel against the nations. And the third oath is, lo, so actually there are two girsos in the Gemara, which is very interesting. One girsa is, lo yidchaku esaketz. Do not push the coming of Mashiach prematurely. The other has a different girsa. Instead of a dalid, we have a lamed. Lo yerachaku esakates. Don't commit sins that will distance the coming of Mashiach. So dalid and resh in manuscripts are very easily mistaken. So some girsos are lo yidchaku esakates. And some girsos are lo yiracha kuesakates. Okay, be it as it may. What, let's take these three oaths. So again, just a quick review, and then I'll go on to it, some new points. Lo yalu b'choma, do not climb the wall. So this has, it's a little ambiguous because this has two implications, and it's not clear if it's an either or or both. One implication is, do not come to Eretz Yisrael en masse. Individuals come, but there should not be a movement to bring all of the Jews to Eretz Yisrael before Mashiach comes. But there's a second implication. Do not try to conquer the land of Israel by force of arms. So there's a little bit of an uncertainty. Uh, are these two independent variables? that we shouldn't encourage mass aliyah? Or is it all connected? Do not try to conquer Eretz Yisrael by force of arms in order to bring the Jewish people back. So there's an ambiguity right there. Uh, there are indeed some authorities who understood the first oath that individuals come, but there should not be a mass aliyah. There are some who did understand it that way. Others seem to understand it, that the emphasis is not on mass aliyah, that's a beautiful thing, that's a good thing, but the emphasis is on do not conquer uh, Eretz Yisrael from a foreign government 
in order to establish Jewish sovereignty. Now, again, please, uh, as I'm talking, probably people's temperature is rising. Uh, let, me just, let me just emphasize, I'm right now quoting and explaining a Gemara, and even last week I already told you uh, different interpretations of this. But bear with me a little bit, even if uh, your blood is boiling. I, I can assure you I am, uh, although I have, I have friends in Satmer and even friends in Naturikarta, I am neither Satmer nor Naturikarta, uh, so right now I'm not telling you my hashkafa. I'm just going over a passage in the Gemara. So Lo Yalu B'choma says, do not try to establish a Jewish presence or a Jewish state or a Jewish government in the land of Israel if that would necessitate military conquest. The second is a general rule, which is almost a corollary of the first, do not rebel against the governments in which you uh, live under. Jews should be loyal citizens. Do not be revolutionaries. Of course, Jews are always, are in fact, always revolutionaries, but this is the second shvua. And the third shvua depends, of course, on the girsa. If you are gores, lo yirachaku asaketz, that's actually a simpler explanation. That simply means Try to be righteous. Do not do the things that delay the coming of Mashiach. That, that's actually a relatively simple idea, and it's basically telling the Jewish people, be as righteous as you can. The first Gersa is a bit more enigmatic. Lo yitchaku esaketz. Don't push Mashiach to come earlier than it would, should come uh, what does that mean practically? I mean, we pray for the coming of the Geula all the time. One of the 13 principles of Emuna is Ani Mamin Be'emuna Shalema Be'viyas HaMashiach Im Kol Zahachaka Lo B'chol Yom B'chol Yom She'yavo And of course, Chabad's campaign We Want Mashiach Now Is that a violation of Lo uh, Yitzchel Gosaket. So apparently the meaning of this third shvua is very enigmatic and it's ultimately bound up in Kabbalah. And that is apparently there are mystical means, largely not known to us, which can bring the Mashiach before we have reached an organic stage of spiritual development where we're worthy of it. And the warning is simply kind of directed to the mystics among us, do not try to bring Mashiach earlier than it's supposed to come because that can have devastating consequences. Now, if we bring Mashiach by Torah and mitzvot and Avas Yisrael, that's perfectly good. That's what you're supposed to do. But don't bring it artificially on because that could be very, very destructive. Okay, so the third shvua we're not going to focus on so much. Even the second shvua we're not going to focus on so much. Uh, but the first Shavuah, Lo Yalu B'choma, I had mentioned, uh, again, this is by way of review a little bit, that this is an, the, the, the Yated, this is the, uh, the peg, the fundamental uh, argument of the Satmar Rav uh, and the Turi Karta, that it is prohibited for the Jewish people to establish a state until the coming of Mashiach, because establishing a, establishing a state would be a violation of this oath that we made to God, lo yalu b'choma, that we will not try to conquer the land of Israel by force from the ruling authorities. And again, the Satmar Rav makes very, very clear that this has nothing to do with whether it's a religious state or not a religious state, even if the Rosh Hashanah, even if the Prime Minister and the Cabinet and the whole Knesset, they would be tzaddikim who spend the afternoons learning in kolel, right? They do the government work in the day and in the morning and do kolel in the afternoon. It makes no difference if it would be the Chafetz Chaim or whatever it would be. Now, as you understand this, in other words, one aspect is the secular nature of Zionism. That's one aspect of it, but this has nothing to do with that. Loyalo B'choma basically says, according to the Satmar Rav's understanding, not allowed to have a state until the coming of Mashiach. It's a violation of this oath. Now, I had already pointed out that it's absolutely clear 
that Ramban, at least, could not possibly accept this Gemara as authoritative, simply because the Ramban not only says it's permissible to have a state, the Ramban apparently says that's part of the mitzvah of Yisha Eretz Yisrael. Remember, as we explained extensively, when the Ramban says there's a mitzvah to live in Eretz Yisrael, that doesn't only mean, it does mean, a mitzvah to live in Eretz Yisrael. But it's not, just, it's not just a mitzvah to live in Eretz Yisrael. There's a mitzvah to establish Jewish sovereignty over everything within the territorial boundaries. People forget that. According to the Ramban, it is not just living here that matters. After all, many need to require to live here. It is the establishment of Jewish sovereignty. Now, obviously, if this is a mitzvah in the Torah to establish Jewish sovereignty, that couldn't be overridden by some oath we took later. I mean, what is the halacha generally if you make an oath to violate the Torah? The oath is null and void. So it's very, very clear that either the Ramban had a different understanding of that Gemara, which I don't even know what it would be, or the Ramban maintained that was an agadic state. Sorry, that was an agadic statement, which represented one particular person. So they had the Turikarta even in the time of the Amoraim, but it does not rec- it does not represent normative halacha. So that, that's the point number one. That you know you have this Gemara, which may mean a certain thing. But it's absolutely clear that Ramban did not follow that Gemara in his codification of the mitzvah of Yishuv Eretz Yisrael. Okay. Uh, but be it as it may, I, what I want to point out today is something new, and that is, fascinatingly, and it's hard to know the source, if you look at Rashi in Shir Hashirim, Rashi, without even quoting a Medrash, so it's, it's hard to know where Rashi got this from, has an absolutely, totally different interpretation of those words. So what I want to do today is, really, if I would have had a PowerPoint or whatever, uh, or I should have done a handout, but I want to compare phrase by phrase in this Pasuk how Rashi interprets it and how the Gemara and Kesubas interprets it. And interestingly enough, according to Rashi, the Gemara and Kesubas has no relevance whatsoever to Aliyah, and no relevance whatsoever to Jewish statehood. It is talking about a totally different matter. So let's first look at the verse from the standpoint of the Gemara's interpretation. The verse says, and this verse appears three times in Shira Shirim, virtually identical. The first time and the second time, the words are exact. The third time, there's a one-word difference, which I, I can't explain, but... Other than that, the psukim are identical. Hishbati, okay, phrase one. Hishbati et chem benot Yerushalayim. I impose a shavua. I impose an oath upon you, daughters of Jerusalem. So, according to the Talmud, who is talking to whom? According to the Talmud, the speaker of Hishpati Etchem is none other than HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This is the Gemara's interpretation. God is making an oath upon the daughters of Jerusalem. According to the Gemara, who are the Benot Yerushalayim? They are Am Yisrael. So in terms of speaker and audience, the Gemara is locating this as HaKadosh Baruch Hu is imposing a Shavua on the Jewish people. Hishpati etchem benot Yerushalayim. Why, just as an aside, why would the Jewish people be referred to as benot Yerushalayim? The answer is because every Jew, every Jew, no matter where you are, you have to consider yourself a child of Yerushalayim. You're a bas. It's to use the feminine. Every person is a bas Yerushalayim. You actually see this from Eicha, right? Uh, because it talks about, uh, you know, Yerushalayim is like a widow who is bereft of her children. We are the children of Yerushalayim. That's the biblical imagery. It's a little mixed. 
We're both the husband of Yerushalayim, because she's an almana, and we are the children of Yerushalayim. But Yerushalayim. You know, they tell the story, just as to digress for a moment, that there's a medrash that asks the question, Yosef HaTzadik died, of course, in Mitzrayim, but he merited to have his bones carried in the desert for 40 years, and he was buried in Eretz Yisrael. Whether Shechem or wherever Yosef is buried, there's a bit of a machlokas there. But Yosef was Zohar, the Torah itself says, Yosef was Zohar, to be carried to Eretz Yisrael. Maishu Rabbeinu, it was decreed that he could not enter Eretz Yisrael, but why couldn't he be buried in Eretz Yisrael? Why did Moshe Rabbeinu not even get a kavura in Eretz Yisrael? So the Medrash gives an amazing answer. It says, Yosef did not deny his origin. Uh, when he's speaking to the Sar Hamashkim, he says, I am Me'eret Sa'iv Gunav Gunavti, Me'eret Sa'iv Rim. I was stolen, I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, meaning I come from the land of the Evrim, which is Eretz Yisrael. So Yosef is Moda Piarzo. Yosef admits where he comes from, therefore he merits to be buried in the land. When Moshe runs away from Mitzrayim and he's in Midian, and he saves the daughters of Yisro, he protects them at the well. So they come back to their father and they say, Ish Mitzri, an Egyptian man, saved us, which means apparently Moshe identified himself to them as Ish Mitzri. Because that's, that's what they called him, so presumably that's what he said he was. So the Medrash says, Moshe is Kofer Biartso. Moshe denies his origin. Since Moshe denies his origin, he does not merit being buried in the land. Yosef acknowledges his origin. He is Zoha to be buried in the land. Moshe denies his origin. He's not Zoha to be buried in the land. So the question is very obvious. Moshe never was an Eretz Israel. I mean, Moshe is not denying anything. Uh, he was born in Mitzrayim, and he came from Mitzrayim. Yosef was born in Eretz Yisrael, so he says this is where he's from. The Medrash seems to be saying there is some complaint against Moshe Rabbeinu that he didn't tell the Benot Yisrael that he's from Eretz Yisrael. But he wasn't. What's the, what's the complaint? So the Svarim say, a Jew has to feel that even if you live in Chutz Laaretz and you've never even been in Eretz Yisrael, you are a child of Eretz Yisrael. This is where you are. And Moshe should have said, uh, I am from Eretz Yisrael, but I was born in Mitzrayim or whatever it would be. This is how you have to identify yourself. And for that reason, Moshe Rabbeinu did not merit to be buried in Eretz Yisrael because that's called a kefira ba'artza. They say with Hasidic Sherebi, who had been in, um, in, uh, in Poland, his family had been in Poland for 500 years. Whenever he was asked uh, where he's from, he would say, Ich bin a Yid von Yerushalayim, I am a Jew from Yerushalayim, but for the past 500 years, you know, we haven't been, we haven't been home. We haven't been home. Actually, people from Brooklyn often talk the same way, but uh, <laughs> you meet them in Baltimore or whatever. I'm really from Brooklyn, uh, whatever. Um, you know, Rabbi Wein, he should be well, um, tells the story that when he was building uh, his yeshiva in Muncie, so somebody offered him special wood, timber from uh, Finland that has a useful non-warping life of 350 years, meaning average wood is 75 to 100 years, and then you got to repair it or replace it at least because it bends or it warps and the like. This was a special high-quality wood that lasts for more than 300 years. Uh, so it really would have saved a lot on repair. It would have been a much more durable structure. So Rabbi Wine said he refused to accept it because he was not going to build a structure 
in the Gola with the intention that it should last 300 years. Because when you do that, you're making a statement that you're not connected to Eretz Israel, you're not thinking about Mashiach. Meaning, you have to look at life in the Gola as relatively short term. I understand short term doesn't mean tomorrow, uh, it's over, but short term. This is not the permanent situation. Now, I have a Kasha in Rabbi Wine. My Kasha in Rabbi Wine, I should ask him. My Kasha in Rabbi Wine is that he should have taken the wood because the Gemara says that all the yeshivos and Batei Midrash in Chutz Aretz are going to be relocated to Eretz Israel when Mashiach comes. So take the wood and it's going to be here. It's going to be here anyway. So what's the problem? But okay. But the Shalah HaKadosh that makes, an early, that makes the same point much earlier, not about Batei Medrash, but he says he was very critical of Jews who built big mansions uh, in, in the Gola. Because the big mansion, a stone house, a brick house, you know, big permanent things, is kind of making a statement, I regard my presence here permanently. And the truth of the matter is, I mean, even in short term, I, I've seen this. I mean, I, I saw this within my own lifetime, where um, particularly in the, some of you may remember this, uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was a tremendous uh, change of neighborhoods in which shoals had to leave the sub, they had to leave the inner cities and go to the suburbs. So I remember growing up, uh, magnificent, magnificent old style shoals with stained glass windows and, and you know, that's engraving, the Aceres Adibros, beautiful shelves. And like within 10 years, uh, they just, they're, they're now churches. You can still see, and again, halakhically, that's actually pretty improper, but okay, okay, but putting that aside, uh, a lot of these were sold to churches, and you can still see the Aceres Adibros, you know, and like that. They tell the story at, at the dedication of one of these shows, the show dedication, uh, the black uh, pastor of the neighborhood showed up. So, you know, he wasn't invited, and they asked him, like, well, it's nice to see you, but why are you here? So he said, I just want to see the building we're getting in 10 years. <laughs> Which, unfortunately, in the 60s and the 70s, there, there, there really was that type of phenomenon and the like. So you see that the Gola is uh, not a permanent thing. Unfortunately, sometimes it happens that these negative aspects of the Gola uh, have even poisoned us in Eretz Israel. We talk about Gush Katif and the disengagement from Gaza, where we're, it's, it's part of the Hester Panim that, that even in Eretz Israel, we are experiencing many, many aspects of the Galut that uh, we can't go to the Harabayat, you're not allowed to daven in the Harabayat. Okay, putting aside the halakha, so Lamai said there are halakha reasons not to go to the Harabayat. But if you paskin that you're allowed to go to the Harabayat, if you follow that psaq, it's certainly quite a shanda that under Israeli law you're not allowed to daven on the Harabayat because it's going to cause a riot. I mean, that's, I mean, I don't go to the Harabayat, so it's not a relevant halakha for me. But how painful it is that if you maintain that you're allowed to go to that makam, you're not allowed to, to serve Hashem on that makam. What type of thing? So in many, many ways, the truth is we're in Golots no matter where we are, but at least here, at least we're, maybe we feel it even more, but at least we're closer. We're closer to the center of Gul. Okay, so go back, let's go back to the Pasuk. So, Hishpati etchem, Hashem is speaking to the Jewish people. Hishpati etchem, Benot Yerushalayim, so the Jewish people are called Benot Yerushalayim. Then, again, this is the Gemara's interpretation. I'll, I'll, I'll juxtapose it with Rashi in a moment. So then it says, Bitzvahos O Ba'ayolot Hasadeh. So Tzvahot is an unusual, it does not refer to the hosts in Shemayim. Tzvahot is an unusual plural for Tzvi. It's very unusual, but it's translated as deer. D-E-E-R. I impose an oath on you with the deer, tzvaos, o ayolot, gazelles, hasadah. Now this too is enigmatic, just push it shot. I'm imposing an oath on you with the deer or the gazelles of the field. What does that refer to? So the Gemara doesn't say, but Rashi, even I'm not giving you Rashi's overall interpretation, but what Rashi says on this would apply to the Gemara as well, and that is 
the deer and the gazelle are given as an example of something that is very beautiful and graceful, but it's also vulnerable and weak, meaning to say there are many, many predators, like wolves or whatever it is. So a deer is not necessarily, at least in this imagery, a deer is not necessarily a strong animal that can defend itself that well against predators, mountain lions, wolves, and the like. So essentially what God is saying is, if you break this oath, you, beautiful, you're, you as a beautiful deer will be vulnerable to attack and the like. All right, so, so far we're moving. It says, And now we come to the critical words. Im ta'iru v'im ta'oruru es ha'ahava ad shetechbat. So no two verbs here. Ta'iru ta'oruru. And the im in a shavua connotes a negation, meaning do not ta'iru, do not ta'oruru. So the Gemara explains... Toiru is a verb that comes from stirring, like stirring the pot. Or, right? Toiru is to awaken, la horreur. So, don't stir or awaken, and here I don't really have a clear sense of the distinction here, the love, the love, divine love, ad shetechpatz, so this is feminine. Until it is de- she, the love, desires to come. In other words, don't stir up God's love prematurely. So now you can see, based on that translation, how the Gemara then constructs the idea of not rebelling against the nations, not conquering Eretz Yisrael, and this would actually support the girsa lo yidchaku, don't try to bring Mashiach early, because the whole context is, wait until God's love wants to come. Do not bring it on before it's time. So you understand what's going on here. In other words, from this translation, this is how we construct these categories. Do not bring the redemptive potentials earlier than they're ready to come. And as I indicated, the Turi Karta, the Satmar Rav in particular, uh, built a whole foundation against the idea of a state of Israel. He built it upon, I mean, not the only reason, but one of the most important foundations is the Shalosh Shavuot, the three O's. Now, I had already mentioned, just again, forgive me for for repeating uh, stuff from last week, that even, number one, the Ramban does not accept this Gemara B'chlal, it seems. But number two, I had mentioned the idea that um, the state of Israel was in fact not created by military activity. The state of Israel was created by international consensus and recognition. Initially, at this, uh, well, it's really starting with the Balfour Declaration, and culminating in San Remo Conference and then United Nations recognition. And the military activity that was generated in connection with the founding of the state was not to create the state. It was to defend a state that had already been recognized by the international community. So therefore, the answer is, this was not the Revolutionary War. This was not like the United States overthrowing British rule. Uh, This was a defensive war for a state that was recognized by the international community. So that's one reason. And then I had mentioned another reason from Rav Meir Simcha, the Or Sameach, who said that if you read the Gemara further, you will recall there's a fourth oath in the Gemara that the Umota Olam promised not to oppress us excessively. And since they didn't keep their oath, so we're not bound by our oath. The contract has been breached. Uh, 
Okay, so those are different answers. So essentially, uh, if you're not in a Tarikarta, you will respond to the Shalosh Shavuot in three ways. Number one, who says we follow it? Ramban clearly does not follow it. That's answer number one. Number two, uh, Medinat Yisrael was not established by military activity. It was established by international agreements, and the military activity was defensive after the fact in nature. And answer number three uh, would be that the Shalosh Shavuot remain binding only as long as the Umot Ulam are not Mishabed Yisrael Yoter Midai, and since uh, obviously they did, and remember, of course, the uh, Midinat Yisrael was founded in the ashes of the Holocaust, as it were. Uh, but even before that, uh, the, there are some Arsimach wrote before the Holocaust, he said, the Umot Olam had violated uh, their commitments, uh, and therefore were not bound. I should also add that some interpret uh, Lo Yalu Bachoma only refers to building a Beit HaMikdash. It does not even refer to a state, meaning don't build a Beit HaMikdash, so that obviously wouldn't be a problem either. Okay. But what I want to do now is show you that if you look at Rashi in Shir Hashira, you see it as Rashi has a radically different translation of the whole Pasuk every time it appears, all three places, which, in which it has nothing to do with this issue whatsoever. So I want to go over Rashi because it's interesting to compare Rashi's translation from the Gemara. He, first, first of all, Rashi changes the speaker. Listen to this. Instead of hishpati yetchem, I impose an oath on you. According to the Gemara, the speaker is God, and he is speaking to the Jewish people. According to Rashi, the speaker is the Jewish people who are imposing an oath on the nations of the world. Hishpati etchem, Benot Yerushalayim. So according to Rashi, the Jewish people, again, this is symbolic. We, we're not referring to an actual conversation, but this is a symbolic conversation. I impose an oath on you, nations of the world. Now, which means, what is Benot Yerushalayim? Benot Yerushalayim are the Umot HaOlam. So let's stop right there. Why would the Benot Yerusha, why would the Umot HaOlam, I explained before why the Jewish people are called Benot Yerushalayim, because that's our home, that's our, our source. Why would the Umot HaOlam be called Benot Yerushalayim? That's a very strange name for the Umot HaOlam. So the Meforshim explained that according to Rashi, Rashi himself doesn't say, but according to Rashi, since the nations of the world have such a yearning to control and dominate Jerusalem. So it's kind of, they become almost children of Jerusalem, not, not in a spiritual sense, but those who have this big desire, right? Uh, as you know, everyone has a desire to control Jerusalem one way, one way or the other. Okay, so now, so, so you see, number one, how Rashi radically changes the translation. Hishpati etchem benot Yerushalayim. Now, then we have bitzvahot, o bayolot so, that, so that's going to be the same. The imagery of the deer or the gazelle being vulnerable and weak, except the Jewish people are saying, if you violate this oath, God will make you vulnerable and weak. Talking to the Umot But now, im ta'iru v'im ta'oriru. Two verbs. So this is very important. According to the Gemara, ta'iru means to stir up, ta'oriru means to awaken. Don't stir up, don't awaken. Rashi has an absolutely radical opposite interpretation. Ta'iru means to destroy. And Rashi brings a Pasuk in Tehillim where it talks about the Chorban Beis Hamikdash is Oru Oru. Destroy, destroy. Ad HaYesod, until the foundation. This is in the capital of Tehillim, Al Naharot Bavel. So, so, do not destroy 
And Ta'oruru, Rashi says, does not come from awaken, but it comes from undermining. For example, in, even in modern Hebrew, when you appeal a case, you want to appeal a case, it's ir ur, la ar er. So according to Rashi, im ta'iru, the im ta'oriru, do not destroy, sorry, do not destroy, and do not undermine God's love. Let's we'll see what that means. Ad. Now the word ad is very, very interesting. The normal translation is until. But Rashi brings a number of psukim where ad can mean while something's happening. So I'm going to read the translation according to Rashi and then tell you what Rashi says the meaning is. We, the Jewish people, impose an oath on the nations of the world. Do not destroy, do not undermine God's love for us as long as God, as long as, while God is desirous of maintaining that love. Says Rashi, this simply means that we are telling the Jewish people, do not undermine our faith in Hashem when we are under your control. Meaning to say, God will get you for it. In other words, it is simply saying, the Jewish people are declaring, we will be faithful to Hashem in the Galut. So you see how many changes Rashi is making in this interpretation. Number one, who is the speaker? Number two, to who, who is being addressed? Number three, the translation of Ta'iru and Ta'oru. And number four, Ad. Does Ad mean until or does Ad mean while something is going? But the bottom line is, according to Rashi's translation of the Pasuk, the Pasuk is not referring to conquering Eretz Israel. It's not referring to rebellion. It is simply essentially declaring that we adjure the nations to let us keep the mitzvot, even in the Gola, which really means it's a declaration of faith on our part, meaning it, it, it becomes rhetorical. It, the nations are not making any such oath, but it's as if I declare, I will be faithful to Hashem, no matter what my conditions are. Okay, so uh, the point I wanted to make is that the whole binyan against the Medina or wh whatever it would be uh, is based on the Gemara and Kesubis. And of course, that, the Gemara is there, right? I mean, you can't, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the Gemara is deleted, but it's very, very interesting that Rashi and Shira Shirim has a totally different translation of the verse, which is very, very fascinating. He changes it in many, many ways, and the whole message is different. Uh, it's nothing to do with Aliyah, nothing to do with Kibush Haaretz. It has to do with our commitment to remain loyal to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in spite of the adversities of the Gola. And although I have to say that we have not always lived up to that as an entire nation, but there always have been Yechidim, Holocaust, whatever it would be, who no matter what was happening, they were faithful to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Jews who have died al Kiddush Hashem, the Jews that were Moser Nefesh under all of the conditions that one could imagine. Um, I remember reading a, a memoir of a, a woman who grew up in Stalinist Russia, and uh, they practiced Yiddishkeit very much in secret, but they were very, very firm. But school was Saturday, so they had school on Saturday. So like she talked about, like, for 10 years, she had to come up with a different excuse every time why she couldn't write. They had one day a broken arm and a broken, whatever. I mean, the, the, the whole week was spent with figuring out what the excuse would be, and somehow she managed. And they described she was like 35 or 40 when she finally left uh, Russia. And she described as they were flying out and they left uh, the airspace of the Soviet Union. 
she said, Baruch Hashem, I'm out of there. Baruch. It was like a, a sense of, I'm out, I'm out. It was like being in prison for all of those years. An amazing, amazing thing. So, um, it is interesting where Rashi got it from. I, I didn't do it. The, the Medrash and Shira Shirim is huge, so it might very well be a Medrash, but I don't think uh, any Medrashic sources cited. You know, as you know, the overwhelming majority of Rashi's comments are normally based on Chazal, Medrash, Gemara, whatever it would be. Uh, in fact, um, the Chama Libut has a very, very interesting essay because it is, it is a worthwhile subject. And that is, what are the criteria for the Midrashim that Rashi incorporates. Because somebody might say, well, what, so why should I bother learning Rashi? I'll just learn Medrash. So you learn Medrash, and you'll see 50 interpretations, and Rashi will give you three. So why did Rashi choose three and reject 47? And there's a whole chachma. It's not just, it's not just a haphazard thing that Rashi chose three. So Nechama Leibowitz, Lea uh, Shalom, wrote a whole book, uh, not a whole book, but a, long, a very long essay on the criteria that Rashi must have used in choosing Midrashim. Now, I'll just tell you, Bikitzer, it's not our subject, but it's an, it is an interesting subject. So it's interesting, I, I permit myself a digression. There's a very big machlokas. A Nechama's own view, I call her Nechama because she wanted to be called Nechama, so not, not, not out of disrespect, uh, Nechama's own view was that Rashi's primary considerations were linguistic. In other words, he wanted to explain psukim according to syntax, according to grammar, according to diktuk, according to context. Now, many midrashim are like non apparently non-grammatical, and they don't fit the overall context of the verse. So she made the point that Rashi would pick the Midrashim that are most consistent with the, what's called Pshat, consistent with the linguistic and syntactical and contextual structure of the verse. So instead of looking at the Midrash as an isolated Pasuk, you could then integrate it with the whole. Now in truth, in truth, uh, in Shira Shira in particular, Rashi makes uh, her point explicitly. Rashi will give, offer a medrash and then say, there are other midrashim here, but I'm not going to mention them because they don't fit the running nature of the narrative. So there's no question that her point is correct. But others have pointed out that apparently Rashi had other objectives as well. Rashi will often bring a medrash or a chazal that is inspirational or pedagogical, meaning Rashi had other aims other than parshanut. Uh, Rashi also had an aim to educate us, inspire us, uh, make us understand the values of Judaism. So apparently that sometimes overrid Rashi's commitment to pshat, and Rashi will sometimes bring a medrash that's not pshat, because it has such a beautiful teaching that it's something we need to know. And in fact, it's fascinating. There are so many chazals, which are in the Gemara and the medrash, that we kind of know them from Rashi, or even people who are not so learned in Yeshiva know them from Rashi. Rashi popularized an enormous number of teachings that the kid who left Cheder at, at 14 would never have learned in Gemara. But he knew them from Rashi, from the Rashi in Chumash. And therefore, uh, Professor Grossman, Avram Grossman, uh, made the argument that Rashi was not just looking at linguistics and syntax and diktuk, he also perceived himself as having a mission to be a teacher for the future generations of Amisha. So again, I don't see this as a stira. I mean, there's nothing inconsistent with an author having more than one, one objective. But the reason I went on to this digression is because I believe that Rashi's comment of Hishpati Yetchem, I believe, I have, to, I have to double check, is not even based on a medrash at all. It is Rashi's own understanding of the Pasuk. And to me, that's a little unusual because the Gemara and Kasubos obviously had a different understanding of that Pasuk. So why did Rashi uh, deviate from them? I'm sorry, someone had a hand up? Uh, uh, yeah. Does Rashi have any commentary on that Gemara when he gets to the Pasuk? Yeah, Rashi, Rashi comments on the Gemara, sure. What, what's he say on the Gemara? 
Loyalu Bachoma, do not try to gain Eretz Yisrael by force of arms. He interprets it exactly the way the Turi Kaita interprets it. And he doesn't indicate why we don't paskin like that or whatever it is. So in the Gemara, he goes with the Gemara. And in Shira Shirim, he goes with a different, a different interpretation of it. Yeah. Yeah, they say, and, and I, I, I don't know how to reconcile this, because the Brisker Rav, Rav Yisrael Salvation, the last Rav of Brisk who came to Eretz Yisrael and died in Eretz Yisrael, uh, was a well-known anti-Zionist. I mean, he essentially identified uh, not with modern interrecard, which I think he would dismiss as crazy, but I'm talking about, you know, against the Medina. And yet, the Briskorov is quoted as saying that in 1948, that this was a chiyuch, this was a smile from HaKadosh Baruch Hu to bring comfort to a devastated nation of Am Yisrael after the enormity of the suffering. Hashem wanted to give us a hug, wanted to give us a kiss, wanted to say, I'm with you. Uh, which is a beautiful sentiment. I, I just don't know how to reconcile it with everything else that's quoted in the name of the Briskorov. So I, I don't know, but, but the Briskorov himself acknowledged that this was Hashem's reassurance to his people in the aftermath of the, of, of the Holocaust. Yeah. You're talking about the time of Yahushua. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is 100% correct. Uh, obviously, the original settlement of Eretz Yisrael, after uh, Yisias Mitzrayim, after Moshe Rabbeinu's death, <coughs> was through military conquest. And that lasted for many, many years. Uh, the military conquest was not completed all the way until David HaMelech and even, even afterwards and, uh, and the like. But apparently, this is a post Horban oath, meaning the, the, the philosophy that's being expressed is once God kicks you out, uh, God has to bring you back, and you can't do it on your own. Uh, of course, some would argue, well, we never do it on our own. If we're successful, it's because Hashem wanted us to come back. It's like, um, what did somebody say? Somebody said uh, to a Satmer who was saying, you can't have a Medina, you have no right to do this and that. So the person says, all right, so what should we do? Wait until Mashiach. He says, what will Mashiach do? Oh, Mashiach will build these beautiful buildings and do all these different things. He says, so we already have these buildings. I mean, what, what's the fact? We should, like, destroy the buildings so they're going to be rebuilt again? Like, you know, what's, what exactly would, would, the point, uh, would, the point, uh, would the point be? Okay. So now I just want to mention one other thought, you know, um, again, not directly relevant, but per- yeah, well, somewhat relevant. This is the Parsha of... of Balak, right? And uh, Balak, of course, hires Bilam to curse B'nai Yisrael. And three times Bilam tries to curse B'nai Yisrael. And every time he curses, Hashem changes the words to Abraham. Balak is, of course, very upset. I'm not sure if Bilam had a money back guarantee or you lost your deposit. I don't know because apparently Balak paid a lot of money. Uh, it's not clear if he got any of it back or not. You know, Bilam may have, a, whatever the policy is. Um, but Bilam then speaks a fourth time. He tried to curse us three times, turned into a bracha. The fourth time, he becomes a prophet. And in truth, as the Rambam explains, he actually is talking about Moshiach. He says, Erenu Vulayata. I see him, but not now. Ashurenu. I gaze. It's not near. This is a messianic vision. Dorach kochav miyakov. A star has stepped forward from Yaakov. Become shevet mi Israel. A staff has come forward from Yisrael. And it will smite the corners of Moab, again, hostile nation, and will undermine, again, these are enemies of the Jewish people. We know, in fact, that this is why Rabbi Akiva renamed, right? The second Mikdash was destroyed, let's say, in the year 70. And then we had a great revolt against the Romans in the year 135. 
And this is called the Bar Kochba revolt. And for a while it was very successful. Bar Kochba liberated 900 villages. There is evidence under the spiritual guidance of Rabbi Akiva. There, uh, the foundations of a third temple were laid. By the way, as a one kasha you might ask in the Satmarav is, hey, how were they allowed to do the Bar Kochba revolt? <laughs> you're telling me you're not allowed to gain Eretz Yisrael. After the Chorban, you're not allowed to gain Eretz Yisrael by force of arms. Well, what on earth was the Bar Kochba revolt? Or for that matter, the Malchus Chashmoinai. In other words, that's something to think about. Meaning, the, the question from Yeshua ben Nun is not such a question because that was pre Chorban. But both the Bar Kochba revolt and the Maccabean revolt were after the Chorban. Well, that could be uh, after the Chorban. Well, the Bar Kochel revolt is after the Chorban by uh The uh, Maccabean revolt was during the Bayashani, but but be either either way, it involves regaining Eretz Israel by conquest. Okay, putting that aside though, Bar Kochel's real name was Shimon Ben Kuziva. Rabbi Akiva named him son of a Kochav. Because Rabbi Akiva believed that Shimon ben Kuziva was Mashiach, and he used the Pasuk in Balat. Torach kochav miyakov. Bar Kochman. Okay. So the Orachayim HaKadosh, whose yard site, it's a big yard site. He's buried in Harazesim. It's coming up, uh, is it the 15th of Thomas? It's, it's coming up very, very soon. Sunday. Yeah, so thousands of people, thousands of people go to, go to Harazesim. So the Archaim asks, what is the double repetition here? Darach kochav miyakov. A star shall step forward from Yaakov. Vakam shevet mi Yisrael. A staff shall rise from Yisrael. What's the Yaakov? What's the Yisrael? What's the repetition? If it's both talking about Mashiach. So the Archaim says a very interesting point. He says that Yaakov is the name that's given to the Jewish people when they're relatively lowly. It's like the heel. Yisrael is the name of triumph and victory that Yaakov was given when he fought with the angel. So Yisrael is miyuchad for tzadikim, Yaakov refers to what we call Hamon Am, the average Jew. So Yaakov is the average Jew. Yisrael are the tzaddikim. Now, Mashiach can come in two different ways. Mashiach can come in a miraculous, supernatural way in which everybody sees the hand of God. And that's called a star, a beautiful star. Or Mashiach can come in a very gradual, slow way, which involves politics and wars, and step by step by step, two steps forward, one step back, a gradual process till he comes. Right? So it says the Arachayim like this. If even the Yaakovs are deserving of Mashiach, meaning if, he, if Mashiach can come because even the average Jew is righteous, Mashiach will come in a supernatural way. But when Mashiach comes only in the merit of the Israel, and the average Jew is not Zoha, then it may be a very laborious, slow, gradual process like a person hobbling on a cane. Come shave it, like a person is on a cane. Now, this ties in very well to one of the thoughts of Rav Cook. much later. We can debate, and we really haven't discussed it a lot, maybe we'll continue the discussion, about the idea of Aschalta de Geula, the beginning of the redemption. Right in the Tfilah, Lishlom Hamadina, 
So the Medinat Yisrael, is the, this is the most controversial line in the whole prayer. And there are shuls that say the prayer and don't say this line. And in the British version of the prayer, which is totally different, this does not appear. Reshit smichat gulatenu. The beginning of our redemption, which is just another way of saying aschalta de geula in Aramaic. That the fact that Hashem allows millions of Jews to come back, we rebuild, this is part of the geula process. So people make the argument sometimes, how could this be part of the Geula process? Number one, so many of the founders of the state and the politicians today are not only non-religious, but many are anti-religious, anti-Torah. And number two, how could something be called part of the redemption if it's filled with wars and terrorism? We would assume Mashiach would be Mashiach. But like the Orachayim, everything fits in. Because Mashiach could come as this burst of a star, but only if Klal Yisrael are tzaddikim, even the Yaakovs. But when Mashiach comes in the zechus of the tzaddikim, and most of us are not worthy, then it will come in a very gradual process. And even people who are rachok from Torah will be involved in the messianic redemption. And the messianic redemption will be accompanied with defeats and milchamots and destruction and setbacks and even giving up things. In other words, the Arachayim is saying that's the nature of gradual geula. That geula is not necessarily a sudden process. Geula is a gradual process. And the revelation of Mashiach is in stages. And there will be a time in which we will reach that stage. But even the prior stages are part of that redemption. And that's the meaning of the double pasuk, or the double phraseology. Darach kochav mi Yaakov, become shevet mi Yisrael. Mashiach can be a kochav, or Mashiach can be a man on a cane. Now, Chazal used a different phraseology based on a Pusik in Zechariah. But one Pusik says, a malach min ha-shamayim. And the other Pusik says, ani v'roche v'alachamor, a poor man riding on a donkey. So the Orachayim takes that dichotomy about Mashiach and he applies it to the kochav and the shevet and the Yaakov and the Israel. So, uh, yeah. Could Bill have been talking about King David? Uh, uh, so you're right. The Rambam himself actually has a very different view, view of this. The Rambam divvies up the Pasuk in two halves. The first half is David HaMelech, and the second half is Mashiach ben David. So, Darach Kochav mi Yaakov is David. Kam Shevet mi Yisrael is Mashiach. Machatz Pase Moab is David, who fought the Moabites. But Karkar Kovane Sheikh. Yeah, so the Rambam in Hilchus Malachim takes these psukim, these couplets, and he says, Bilam, Arenu Bloat, Ashrenu Bloat, the two things. I see him, but not now, is David. Ashirenu Bloat, is Mashiach, right? That's how the Rambam in Hilchus Malachim divides it up. Okay, you all have a wonderful week.